Good morning. Good morning. So, of course, I come with props. Um, and so I hope everyone had an opportunity to pick up uh, our publication, Creating Great School Communities. It's our 2011-2012 uh, Student Code of Conduct. Um, and so I will tell everybody that in my role as the Executive Director of Student Support and Safety in the Baltimore City Schools, my job was to support students. I've now been promoted to another position where I'm supporting all 200 of our schools. However, it does not change the fact that the first thing I did upon arriving in Baltimore City two, uh, excuse me, three and a half years ago was to work with our community partners, our internal stakeholders to revise our student code of conduct. And, and so many of the things or the points that, that Dan has pre, pr, uh, presented or that Judge Teske has presented, we, we did three years ago. Uh, we eliminated the option of suspension for truancy. All right, and, you know, here's a no-brainer. Kids don't want to come to school. Kids are cutting class. And so the consequence is you send them home. You give them more of what they wanted. So that just didn't make sense. The other thing that we really looked at um, was making sure that our schools are implementing alternatives to suspension. Um, this really is not an issue that zero tolerance doesn't work, just like being too permissive works, right? And so as an educator um, for, for over 15 years, I've lived through sort of the debate around whole language versus phonics and which one do you use, and, and the reality is you use both. And, and I would tell you that the issue around zero tolerance or having a school culture that's too permissive, you actually need both. And here's how you do it. You need a zero tolerance to acts of violence and to weapons on campus. No school anywhere in America can tolerate young people coming to school armed with weapons. And in Baltimore City, we are very clear with our young people that our expectation is if you bring that type of instrument or weapon on campus, uh, we are going to deal with you to the fullest extent of the code of conduct. But that's a small microcosm of what happens in schools on a daily basis. And where schools have gotten into trouble and where Baltimore City had to really spend our time refocusing our efforts are exactly what Dan and Judge Teske identified, um, what we call soft offenses. It's the disrespect, the insubordination, failure to obey school rules and regulations. And, and I will tell you as a former school teacher and school administrator, there are better ways to resolve those issues than sending young people home. And so let me just give you evidence because I like Judge Teske, I'm really tough on students that aren't doing the right things. But I believe that part of our job as educators and the role that uh, Baltimore City has taken is that part of our job is to teach young people the expected norms of school behavior. And we're going to work with you and we're going to help you to be successful. Now, let me just tell you, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do, but we also know that there's a, a, a great outcome related to that. So in the four years, we have uh, increased our graduation rate by nearly 20% from right around 51 percentage points to over 71. Now that's something that folks said, Baltimore City, there's no way that they can increase their graduation rate to, to over 70%. You know, with all of the different TV series that have been filmed there, people have a perception that the place is, you know, just unable to be, be changed. And, and that's really not the case. We've got great young people. We've got great teachers and administrators that are working with them. We've also dropped our, you know, decreased our dropout rate by half. When we walked in the door four years ago, our dropout rate was nearly 10%. Now it's 4.2%. And I would say for both of those indicators, both of those metrics, they both are not high enough. All right? We want our graduation rate to be 100%. We want our dropout rate to be 0%. So we know that we still have work to do, but we also recognize that the, the work can be done if you're thoughtful, if you're involving community partners, if you're involving parents and students, and if you're doing a few things like we've done in Baltimore. So here's a couple of things that we've done, and I'm going to give you five. Number one, it was about revising the code of conduct. It was about revising the code of conduct so that we could have consistency in 200 retail outlets all over the city. All right? And so I use the McDonald's analogy. When I go to McDonald's, 
whether it's in Savannah, Georgia, whether it's in Baltimore, Maryland, whether it's in Ireland or Greece, I have the expectation that the French fries I get from McDonald's all taste the same. And so part of what we had to do with our code of conduct and with our administrators is ensure a level of consistency. So on page 25, actually it starts on page 23, you see our matrix and our code of conduct. And so what that does and what we've trained our, our administrators to do is to understand that we are telling you when you can give different types of consequences. So it, the first one is absences. Absences in Baltimore City are level one and level two offenses for which out of school suspension is not an option. It's just not an option. Now, I would like to believe that all of our people are going to follow directions. But we know that everybody gets busy and sometimes maybe they're, don't, they're not. So the next thing we had to do was we had to implement a monitoring system. And I think this goes to Dan's point about knowing your data. So every Friday we have something that we started called Safety Stat, where we monitor every disciplinary incident and every police incident that occurred in the district in the prior week. So if it happened somewhere, I know about it. And my questions are, what happened? Why did it happen? Is that young person a frequent flyer? Is there something we need to do in terms of the supports? And when we talk about supports, we're talking counseling, mental health support, we're talking about a whole host of interventions that help young people to come to school and learn how to conduct themselves appropriately. One, because it's the right thing to do, but two, because it allows us to help them to focus on instruction. Three, right, because two was monitoring. First was the revision to policies and the code of conduct. Two was monitoring with safety stat, attendance stat. Um, number three, was the expansion of alternative education seats. Now, I would argue that alternative education seats are not the seats we want all children in all the time. However, what we found in Baltimore, working with our partners, the health department did a study that identified that students that are suspended and expelled and sent home have a higher probability of becoming either the victims or the perpetrator of crime, including homicide. And so what we recognized is that we had a role to play in helping to redirect behavior and not putting children out on the street. So if children have committed an offense for which we do need to exclude them from their regular setting, we have built alternative settings for them. So that's a small portion of our alternative ed seats. It's about 300 seats. And so let me tell you, we went from 1,000 seats to 2,500 seats in a district with 84,000 children. All right? We also have built seats for, for young people that are over age and under accredited. Because young people that are over age, under accredited, may need to work in smaller settings, more intensive support, and they need the hope that comes from, if I work really hard, I can earn more credits, and hopefully I can either get back on track or I can graduate quicker than staying in school for the traditional four years, and I'm already 17, and I'm not going to stay until 21. Number four, I heard Dan mention PBIS. So I'm going to talk about PBIS as I talk about all of our interventions. And so what we believe is, is prevention and early intervention. Prevention for us are those whole school uh, support models, PBIS being one. We, re we expanded PBIS, positive behavior intervention supports, in our schools from, I think we had 23 schools when I walked in. We now have 108. All right, and so we did a, a, a huge expansion of that based on uh, um, principal, staff, and parent and, and student input. We all also have other schools that are doing character ed and other things. So that's our prevention side. Our early intervention is what we call student support teams. And so 
Um, Bob Belfance out of Hopkins did a great study that identified four factors that identify that can tell you whether or not a young person is likely to graduate. And it, it revolves around a failing grade, grade in reading, failing grade in math, um, poor attendance, and, and suspension. So for student support teams, here are the flags for all of our schools. You can be flagged if your student has attendance issues. You can be flagged if they have academic issues, behavior, or social emotional. And at that point, the school is required to conduct an SST team, a student support team, or if the student has a, a disability, an IEP team to discuss what plan the school can put in place to support the student. Now let's go back to number two, that monitoring. If I see a student's name, that's come across and has multiple suspensions, mm -hmm. my first question is not what's going on with that kid. My first question is what has the school done? What plan have they put in place? Are they working to support the school, the student, and to change the young person's behavior, including functional behavioral assessments, behavioral intervention plans? It's about support for young people. Our young people have really shown that if we work with them, if we build relationships, they are going to be supportive. And then lastly, it is about relationships. It is about the relationships that teachers have with students. It's about the relationships that school police have with young people with admini that administrators have with students. So I'm going to just tell you a story. So unfortunately, this school year, I've already taken, and I'm in charge of school police. I have my own police force, 142 sworn um, officers, gun carrying officers. <laughs> in our schools. Our officers are tasked with building relationships with young people. And so this year, we've taken two handguns off of um, students in our schools. The reason why we were able to recover the weapons and no one was hurt was because teachers had relationships with young people and because school police officers had built those relationships and young people said, I think you need to know this. And so it cannot be overstated the impact of building positive relationships with young people to help them to be successful. And ultimately, as a school system, what we want are for young people to attend school every day, to learn, to grow, to be successful, and to graduate. And we think we're on the, the right track as evidenced by our graduation rate, which is increasing, and our dropout rate, which is decreasing. Thank you. Ellis, um, we'll now take questions. I, I, I just ask any of the press, um, uh, if you ask a question, uh, please identify yourself and your news organization. Um, questions? Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Jean Gossman with Education Daily. Uh, earlier this year, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights held a, a, a public meeting on this <coughs> issue, and they received testimony from several panels of school leaders and teachers who consistently stated, and it's in the, in the public record of the meeting, that the reason that minority students, African-American students, were being disparately treated was because they were indeed behaving badly more often. So I wondered if you could just speak to that, if you have any empirical research yourself. Um, as a school administrator, and I've been in large districts, three states, um, I am appalled at the thought that individuals would attribute certain actions only to certain types of students, when the reality is that it's about the adult response. The adult response needs to be consistency across the board. And what we've attempted to do in Baltimore City is to ensure a level of consistency from school to school so that these issues of disparity don't occur. What I want is I want all students that if they happen to commit a particular infraction, they should all receive within the same range of consequences. If it's a level one offense, they should all get those type of consequences that would only be found in level one. And so it, my response to that is that it really is about what the adults do to 
to address student behavior. It's less about students, what they bring to school. What our school CEO says all the time is students come as is. And so we all have children. We all know that, you know, I've got a five-year-old, and if she's outside with us playing with her sister, one of the things, you know, she might be screaming and yelling and having a great time, but when she comes in the house, we have to remind her, you need to use your inside voice. Part of the role of schools is to teach young people the acceptable norms of school behavior, um, and that's what our student code of conduct does. to go in and pick up work, or sometimes students are paced, placed in probation schools before they've been uh, found guilty of, of an infraction. Yeah, um, I think Dan and I are probably on the same page with that. The, the statutes, state by state, of, they vary. They're different. Um, and so it really is about what the process or the protocol in individual school districts or states would be. And so I can speak for our, our in Baltimore. Um, when a student is being charged with, um, first of all, principals in Baltimore City don't have the ability to suspend student for more than five days. So that was one of the first decisions our school CEO made, right? Because the more time you're out of school, the, the, the worse your academic achievement is going to be. And so if you want to suspend a student, for an, ex uh, an extended suspension or an expulsion, you have to propose them. You send it to one of my offices, which is the Office of Student Suspension. Um, you have to send the packet within three days. We attempt to hold the case or the hearing within five days so that we can then make a determination and get the student into their next placement if they are found to have committed the offense as quickly as possible. So with our process, Everything is done within, I would say, seven or eight days, including um, the placement at the next school. Now, in terms of special education, if the student is a special needs student, um, even though the student may have not had any prior suspensions, if you propose the student for a long-term suspension or expulsion, you have to do a manifestation hearing. It's another safeguard. We want to make sure that the offense was not actually a result of the handicapping condition. And then in terms of appeals um, to our school board, um, every parent uh, is provided information um, about the appeals process and have the ability to appeal uh, the decision to the school board, and the school board will hold that. And that appeal um, takes place. Um, you have 10 days to appeal, and then you know the hearing officer will hear that. But while that's taking place, in Baltimore City, we place the student in an alternative educational setting so that the student is not sitting out on the street and not receiving instruction. Well, we don't actually have a probation school, all right? So what we have are um, alternative schools that we've set up that operate under the same policies, the same curriculum, where we're trying to keep the students on track as they determine um, you know, how long they're going to be there, what their course of action is going to be before they return to their traditional schools. We have time for probably two more questions, so I'm going to take um, the, 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 the back and then over here. Um, I'm Veronica DeVore from the PBS NewsHour, um, and I had a question for both uh, Judge Teske and Mr. Bryce. Um, I'm wondering about um, the challenges you may have faced, uh, budgetary or otherwise, in implementing your um, discipline, discipline reform plans um, in your respective districts, and what you feel might be preventing other districts from doing the same. Um, I'm going to say ditto with uh, two things. Um, I think it takes a, a, a great judge to really see this as a problem, um, but in, in terms of 
the, the budget issue, really not a budget issue. It was a priority for city schools. We've got a great CEO, Dr. Andres Alonzo. Uh, it, it was a priority. Uh, the other issue is, you know, sort of changing school culture. And schools are organic institutions that have lots of tradition. And if the tradition had been, if you look at me the wrong way or say something funny to me that I push you out, then we had to change that mentality. And we spent a lot of time working with our administrators to change the culture so that they understand how important it was to hold on to kids and stop pushing them away. Because when we push them away, we push them into things we don't want them involved in. We're going to have to leave this room.